Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Why don't we get started? Hello, I'm Sujay King Liu, and I'm the Dean of the College of Engineering. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here to hear Dr. Judy Chow, Senior Vice President and Global Head of Biotech for Bayer Pharmaceuticals. Um, this presentation is part of a series called View from the Top, where we bring industry leaders to come share the uh, experience and the words of wisdom with us. Uh, today, we're delighted also to welcome uh, special guests from the City of Berkeley, Office of De uh, Economic Development, as well as uh, members of Judy Chow's team from Bayer. And I'm really happy to know that many of them are actually Berkeley alumni. Um, so welcome back to campus, and welcome to you all. So um, Judy and her team have been very generous. They actually brought some gifts uh, with them today. So uh, at the end of the talk, when you exit, you can pick up a gift. Uh, one of them is a Pops Pocket. Pocket. So you put it on the back of your cell phone, you know, it pops out so you can hold it. Uh, another one, which you actually, the students might appreciate more, is uh, a product is over-the-counter Barocca. It helps to improve your mental sharpness <laughs> and physical energy. So <laughs> can, can they get both or just one? You can actually get one of each. All right. Thank you very much, Judy, and your team. This is really amazing. Okay, so that sets the context for the talk today. But I also, before proceeding, I wanted to acknowledge um, co-sponsorship of today's event uh, by our student group, uh, uh, Society for Women Engineers. Thank you very much for co-sponsoring. Okay, so um, before proceeding, I also wanted to encourage uh, those of you who are here to also come back here on Tuesday, April 16th for another uh, exciting talk as part of a different series called the Coup Lecture Series. Um, it's going to be called From Corey Hall to Silicon Valley, Building a Startup That Thrives. So uh, for those of us who are not alumni, Corey Hall is a, a, a building here that houses the Division of Electrical Engineering. So we actually will have a couple of alumni from Electrical Engineering who are very distinguished, come here. Their names are John George and David uh, Kutrer, who will be sharing their experience launching and running a series of successful entrepreneur uh, tech, tech startups. So now let me tell you more about today's speaker, Judy Chow. She comes to us with more than 20 years of experience in the biomanufacturing and drug, manufacturing, uh, drug development industry. As global head of biotech development for Bayer Pharmaceuticals, she oversees the manufacturing and distribution of Bayer's $3 billion biotech product portfolio, and she leads drug development activities for the biologics pipeline. She be began her career in the biotech industry as a senior scientist at Abbott, and she quickly moved on and up to places like Wyeth and Genentech before joining Tanvex Biopharma in 2010 as Vice President of R&D and Manufacturing. She's well recognized for her work in the development of the technologies that accelerate the characterization and development of new products. Throughout her career, she has achieved significant milestones in protein therapeutic development and multiple filings of biologics license applications and investigational new drug applications for novel products. Her keen instincts in R&D helped to guide the product project pipeline at Tanvex and contributed to the company's successful IPO in 2017 on the Taiwan Stock Exchange. Judy continued to garner more leadership experience as Vice President of Pharmaceutical and Technical Operations at Pfizer, formerly Mediva Medivation, before she joined Bayer in 2017. So it's not, it shouldn't be surprising that last year, San Francisco Business Times named Judy to its annual Most Influential Women in Business list. Congratulations, Judy. <laughs> so it's very interesting to know her background, actually. Before she was in industry, Judy did some time in academia. Not to make it sound like it's, you know, prison. <laughs> um, but she was a research faculty member at Harvard University Medical School. She's a medical doctor by training. There she focused on cell biology and neuroscience research. She obtained her PhD in biochemistry and in cell biology from Yale University and completed her bio postdoctoral training at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. And we're really fortunate to have her 
be able to allocate some time to serve on our on the advisory board for our industrial engineering and operations research department here at UC Berkeley. But today we are extra thrilled to welcome her to uh, come up to the stage to share her insights um, that she's gained from her many years in industry. So please join me in welcoming Judy Chow to speak about being a biotech entrepreneur in a 155-year-old company. Okay, good. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, like many of you in the room, and Sujay gave a little bit of introduction about my background. Actually, back to my high school days, I was um, in the actually engineering track, study for engineer or uh, something related to physics or math. And I have to say, this is probably a little bit hard for you to imagine, but back to my day in the school system I was in, and we were, um, in order to enter in the college, we have to pass a very competitive entrance exam. And the entrance exam for engineer track of physics and math, we don't need to study biology. So we sort of study biology, but not really. Um, so and in order to, and really, you may wonder about them why I actually end up in the medical school. So during my time in high school, I got this inspiration. People ask me about my passion. You probably got most of people ask you this question about what's your passion, what drives you. And the way I explain about passion is then, um, what get you up, right? Nobody even need to tell you, you need to do it and then you'll do it. And to me it was very obvious at the time was the science innovation, but at the same time I found out something very different from my, the track I was in, is I really like to help people. And I feel the people in need when I can do something to them, and that to me means a lot. And that's why I got inspired about it. Then I studied biology by myself and tried to get a different kind of exam and went to medical school. And then you may wonder about, but we just heard you were at a pharmaceutical company in biotech, and why did you become a physician helping the patients? Uh, and I, I'm going to try to share this personal story, and I told my staff this is the first time I do this um, in front of so many people. So this was actually a very, very personal story. So when I was, as you can imagine, with this big ambition about I'm going to combine the science, innovation to helping people, I was so enthusiastic about, I need to get to the most hard to cure disease at the time really is cancer. So that is where then people would die from that, um, you lost your family, and so I put myself into this department it's a, at the time really is a hematology, oncology all together. And, and then I follow a professor working with him very closely, working with patients, and I came to realize what I was doing are three things uh, for the cancer patients. One, try whatever the limit option we can offer, namely surgical rad uh, radiation or chemotherapy, and most of them don't work. And then second thing we do, we learn how to show our compassion to help the patients as well as their family or their loved one face the death. And that is very, very hard uh, situation. The third thing we do, kind of innovatively thinking, is collecting with the patient's consent, of course, collecting the sample or blood sample, things like that, in order to figure out maybe one day we figure out something. This is back the time when un uh, oncogen just got discovered also. And I've been doing that a lot and getting more and more feel frustrated about not a lot of solution I can really <coughs> offer when I'm thinking about it, I can help people. Um, so it was one day, this uh, terminal, uh, terminal pa uh, cancer patient, she has uh, acute myeloid lymph uh, leukemia, checking to the emergency room. So even the information came to us, it's already knowing it is a matter of hours, she will pass away. So then I'm on this mission, went to the emergency room, trying to collect the sample, because uh, you know, you, you collect the life, blood sample is much more valuable information we want to get. Uh, I went there, um, she's there, she's already in coma, um, and couldn't really quite answer. Her son was next to her, probably about 10 year old, 11 year old. What, she say, what he say, I never forgot. Um, he said, Mom, Mom, wake up. The doctor is here to help you. 
And that was very, very hard for me at that moment, listen to this little boy saying that. And he tried very hard to wake her up. I did manage to get her sample, and I was walking with that test tube from the emergency room back to the lab. That is the longest walk in my life. And that long hallway got me keeping looking at that test tube. I even remember now today his, her case number. And the number is purely just a number. It doesn't really mean anything. And I could not do anything to change this person's life. And I wasn't really being able to help her. Um, so I was staring at that test tube. That was the moment I make up my mind. I need to go study more. I need to find more solution. Um, I don't see the path I was in really fulfill my passion towards that. So I make a really surprising decision at the end. Um, didn't pursue to be a medical doctor. Uh, I ended up actually applying to school, come to this country, and went to my graduate school trying to study, understand the science a little bit more. So um, that's really what drive me to where I am. I think uh, thanks to Jay to kind of talk about the story. And Actually, I'm surprised I can talk through that because it was very, very hard. Um, but I never forgot about that moment. And throughout my career, and um, basically, I did, like you heard, uh, big company, small company, academic, and uh, academia to start with, then come to industry. What drive me really is my passion to toward the science, innovation, and I can help people in need. And then. Uh, you may say, oh, that sounds really nice. It's now you have all your passions. So you probably somebody told you, then you have your passion, then everything will be straight. Actually, most of the time, this is how I feel. I'm this uh, <laughs> little <laughs> red fish, and I have my eye open, smile every day with my huge passion, what I'm going to do. And I feel, even though other people may think the other way around, I feel people around me, they'll just close their eyes, they're just swimming totally, go toward di different direction. But the, um, the message I want to share with you is that also then you can see the path for this refuge is not straight. Uh, you need to kind of really navigate it wrong and figure out your way. And um, despite your, you have your passion, you really don't need to define your path that early because you can find all different ways to do that. And then you say, why did you choose then biotech and why biologics is so fascinating to you? And I hope then you can see them naturally. That makes sense. Um, for the tumor cell, and you look at it on this graph on your uh, left-hand side, and the Y shape is uh, very typical nowadays, a protein therapeutics um, biologics, biologic drug, and that is the antibody, and with that yellow, that, that nice uh, red little dots. And this actually, prov those type of drugs is defined very specific toward the class to target certain receptor or certain protein. So with that design, it's much more spe specific to the target rather than small molecule. We go through screening and see which one really win to be able to move forward. At the same time, because it's much more specific, it has less side effect, has much better safety profile. At the same time, because it's so specific target, what will actually trigger the whole mechanism of action, it have the fast onset and it's much more applicable to a lot of patients, and not to mention it's much more curative. And looking at the whole history about what therapeutics um, and uh, biologics really bring to the patient, and I pull some example here for you. So the rare inherited gene disease, in the past, we have to just deal with the disease and most of the patient die early. And now with the biologics approach, we can do the protein replacement or gene replacement and to, in the future, even really gene editing to, to address the disease need. Some tougher disease, like an immunological disease, like autoimmune and inflammatory disease, in the past, it's just painkiller, steroid, and sometimes it's really serious then it need to go through surgical work. But now, uh, with the anti-TNF, I'm proud to say that was my first project in uh, industry. Um, it, it nowadays become, of course, a pretty popular drug. And, and it had be able to help the rheumatoid arthritis patients and address a lot of autoimmune disease issue. From the cancer, as I mentioned already, uh, in, in the past it's a surgical, radiation, and chemotherapy. And now with supporting drug, uh, example like anti-VEGF, and also some target particularly for HER2 
and those are also, I mean, lucky for me, um, during my career, I got to work on those and become uh, uh, the medicine available for patients. It really extends the life. It's p very fascinating seeing the patient come to us to say, I, when I have cancer, I thought that's the end of the day. Now I got to see my son and the grandson and the life totally changed for the patients. And also even the um, macular degeneration, the eye disease, um, in the past, the patient would just go through the blindness and now we have the anti-VEGF solution to do the injection to allow people to be able to see the world. Thinking about from the blindness to be able to open your eyes, see the world, and that's a very, very life-changing uh, difference. And those, frankly speaking, couldn't be achieved without the biologics. But biology didn't come just like that. So like I say, science innovation really changing the world. Um, in the past history, actually really start with the, the biologic extract from the living animals. So back to 1920, it's not like, a, uh, it's not like a, nowadays we all of a sudden thinking about biologic. Back to the old days, definitely they are uh, biologics extract from the animal. And even for the hemophilia drug, we at Bayer working on it back to 1950 and 1960, it has the extraction. And the recombinant technology, I think, is probably not new to you uh, anymore. And that definitely back to the 1970 has introduced some potential drug uh, to the market, but not as popular as today. And the next generation really is this monoclonal antibody design, very specific target, certain, certain therapeutic target and disease. And this art back to the 1980s and 97 at the time finally have the fully humanized antibody. And I happen to be really running on this wave of to uh, introduce the first um, human, to fully humanized antibody to help, as I mentioned about rheumatoid arthritis. And nowadays we're moving even more further. It's this is cell therapy and gene therapy. And, um, and very recently, there are a lot of very exciting approval in the in recent year with the uh, Chris Capps, and which is the originator from UC Berkeley, and the 2017 also have this CAR T cell, which engineer the cell in order to be able to cure the cancer. So a lot of excitement really is through a lot of science and innovation to help the biologics to grow. And something also unique about biologics is um, it's not the synthetic chemistry. So it needs to go through very intensive and complicated bioprocess and from, like I already mentioned, recombinant technology. And this, like I say, the technology itself is not new. However, you probably appreciate that we need to be consistently again and again doing the same thing and precisely there's no exception and be able to pass the whole quality. That is the tricky part. And definitely the design, you see the process, it's much more complicated. It's almost, um, you probably cannot imagine that, but back to 25 years, years ago, it's considered really as a science fiction. And today it's real. There are multiple different protein therapeutics available. And even better, as I say, there are more increasing complexity, uh, even though that is more challenging. And it's also interesting opportunity. If I focus your attention in the middle of the slide, that is the antibody. And that's kind of typical. You see how many molecules or daltons are there. And this is tiny little bit in the center is uh, compared, if you zoom out, you see that's compared to the size of aspirin. So this is the classical uh, molecule. And then we can, we can definitely characterize much, much easier for aspirin. But for antibody, we need to be able to characterize from the whole overall three-dimension point of view, as well as down to every single molecule to show Every time when we do the production, it needs to be consistent. So then we can guarantee the safety, the efficacy for our patients. But on your right hand side, this is where then you look at the protein compared to one cell. The whole cell is so big, the protein is just so small. And nowadays, as I say, we're starting looking at cell therapy, looking at a solution about millions of cells inject to the patient. And we need to guarantee as a pharmaceutical company or biotech company, this will be consistent and have the e efficacy and also safety the patients are counting on us. So definitely there's a lot of opportunity there. Talking about aspirin, definitely I need to step back, talk a little bit about Bayer. So Bayer is a 155-year-old one, company, um, and we're very proud about um, aspirin as the first launch by, 
from there, 1899. And you can see back to the old days how aspirin was produced. We're absolutely not producing aspirin this way anyway, so I don't want to <laughs> give you the wrong idea. Um, and, but today we need to quickly move into the modern day of a pharmaceutical company in order to survive so many years. We need to look at a new pipeline on your right hand side is showing currently our pipeline and we're just trying to enrich a lot of biologics because that as I show you so many advantage of having the biologics and we are not the company having a lot of those pipeline yet. So that is where the challenging of my title about coming to bear and then trying to develop something new, right? Um, not that new to the degree about to the outside world this is a totally novel drug, but it's kind of new for the company have to figure out a way fast introduce. Bayer is not totally new to the degree about not following the whole science. So the innovation track for our hematology product from your left hand side, we start having the product from the 1969 have the uh, plasma drift um, product and then going to the recombinant through di two different generations. Last year, we're very proud to introduce our long acting recombinant factor A and this allow patient to have less injection, longer efficacy to be able to sh uh, reduce the whole composite of our injection, much better uh, factor A uh, expression. But that's not it. We need to look at the antibody and um, for different kind of target which address the mechanism of pathway and also we are doing the gene therapy in the clinical trial. So this is uh, the idea about innovation really need to come along and what other strategy we uh, implement in order to catch up um, in, the, in a startup setting in the big pharma. The other strategy we call that leaps. So instead of following people along, we're always behind. And why don't we actually take the leaps, get not necessarily ahead, but at least jump onto what others already learn. And so on your left hand side, the ambition we have is then find out the exactly fundamental breakthrough. So don't look at the small signs. That something really is a breakthrough. That's why we're targeting. So then we are ambitious to say we don't just want to treat the disease. We want to cure the disease and to prevent the disease. And that's our ambition going in. How are we going to do that? As I say now, um, the biologists definitely pre uh, provide a lot of ad advantages on your right hand side. There's five particularly most promising technology. You can see everything all associated with bio biologics, the DNA editing, RNA uh, activation, cell therapy, and microbiome, and also RNA inhibition. Those are our target therapeutic and also the innovation side. So you can see I mentioned about the innovation, I mentioned about the science. Then you say, well, I kind of follow you. You, you will say your passion is in science, innovation, and you like to help people. What does that have something to do? So the way I look at it is really, um, we need to have some sort of startup spirit. St startup tends to be the company introduce much more novel uh, drug in biologics field. That's the strength of the startup is nimble and swift and also effective in decision making and much more novel science can be introduced. And the mature global company, what we offer is then a stable and established system and much more systematic approach and the infrastructure to support that. So the way I look at this, um, more or less like uh, I, I will consider startups like the small tuck boat. So when you are getting closer to off the shore, you need this tugboat to get this going. Um, then the big pharma is like this uh, container, big ship, and you compare to the size of the tugboat is there. And but this is where then have the established system to help to navigating through the big ocean. So you look at it if we see the journey as um, from the one side getting startup idea to get going. You cannot get the container too close to the shore because you got stuck or will not be able to move. But the talk will, the st startup idea and system, be able to move that quickly, get it to the container. And the container need to go through this big all journey for the drug development. It's a high risk about a lot of things on the ocean can happen. But when you're getting closer to the finish line, that means we already get to the stable uh, drug market. We need to be nimble again to allow the resource going to where to establish the new idea. And from the finish line, then we need to start act like this small boat. So the idea really is to complete the whole journey. We need to have the startup agility, like this little tugboat on your left hand side. 
and we also leverage what we have, a stable system to navigate through all the risk, you know, the financial risk, and to be able to have that buffer. And then when we're getting closer to the finishing line, or maybe become on the market much more stable, we leverage a lot of partnership in order to enable the drug to become much more agile and going through the, we call the life cycle management. So with that, that is kind of the like idea about how to put everything together, the, not the innovation side, and also how we are going to set up our um, organization to help the patient. And uh, you may sit, sitting there say, that's nice. The, what is that to do with me? Um, so I'd like to throw some idea also. So the one of the thing we combine everything together, the, the way we are approaching, this is kind of reiterate a little bit about my prior point. For the emerging technology, we try to be as nimble as possible. And for the must-win technology, we want to hold it with us. Um, and then for the mature technologies, where we uh, establish a partnership. I want to say is that no matter which side of the column or which boat or ship you are going to be on, uh, it's going to be a very, very exciting journey. And for biotech, again, I go back to that sentence about increasing the complexity and increasing uh, opportunity. Now, still, as I mentioned, 25 years ago, uh, recombinant technology become, can make drug is a science fiction. And nowadays, the cell gene therapy, people are starting to believe it's not a science fiction. But all of us need to make it happen, because it's not there yet. Um, a lot of exciting of a new therapy approach as well as a very complex uh, system. As I showed you, the whole biologic production takes a lot of very careful design. And also, I think hopefully that hit your heart, is also data science is very, very important in a sense for biologics. There's no way we can do the whole bioprocess without a very solid data science. And um, something I always think a very pretty much align with the whole synergy with uh, being an engineer is then it's not just about being the first one to get to the market. It's really the one to get it right. So this, in my mind, I think maybe my, my engineering mind always survive in this world. Uh, okay, that's then we don't get intimidated by, okay, other people already have this uh, anti-TNF, have all those therapeutic. We need to look at it then how do we make it really right to the patient. So there's tons of opportunity. I hope uh, you're thinking about it when you want to be jumping on, like me, hopefully, uh, interested in science and innovation and to make a difference to people's life. Uh, biotech definitely offer a lot of uh, new opportunity there. So, uh, okay, back to my picture. So I, I wish I can tell you then everything will go smoothly and, and as I already say, you may actually thinking about um, going through this, like I say, not so much about picking your path, but really about picking your passion. And at least I hope I show you one little example of my personal life is then I stick to my passion, even though my path looks a little bit different from most of people, uh, from you know, medical school to, to, to study PhD, from academic to industry, from big company to small company, now back to the big company. Um, as long as you kind of stick to your passion, really, you will see, you'll be able to find your path. And it really kind of doesn't matter about how other people around you, what's the path they choose. And I also want to say positively, you may actually feel like this. Uh, a lot of fish is following you. Uh, like then what you are throwing, the idea, and people are really following you. At least at some point, I will say I enjoy my bear's life. Um, we have that, like I, I sometimes have to tell my staff, oh, wow, they really believe me, so that's actually <laughs> good. Um, so that's, uh, uh, I'm sure you'll experience that. And so with that, I probably want to close my talk and thank you for your attention. And, um, and really, I hope you get excited about enjoying the biotech and also go bears. <laughs> Thank you so much, Judy, for sharing with us your personal story and for sharing with us your passion. We do have time now for questions, and we usually like to give preference to the students. Um, please stand and say your name, your major, and your year um, when you ask your question. We have one in the back. Okay, one yeah, in the back. So hi, um, my name is Megan. I'm a third year studying bioengineering. My question was about how you mentioned that you have like you should have like startup style agility to succeed. I was wondering if you had any tips for like how to maintain that at 
you know, the level that you're working at, like sort of big company? So, uh, if I will uh, repeat the question. So the question is how to, how to really make the startup idea going or? Um, yeah, so like even at such a big company to maintain like both sides of like having that agility. Yeah, um, so I happen to run this uh, very unique organization. It's just new to there also. So I have one side really is uh, R&D and then the other side we are this so-called P&L organization, so profit and loss. So basically, basically my performance is measured against how much money we make. That part probably need to cut. The <laughs> 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 and, but in any case, uh, to answer your question, so the way I say really need to have different mindset. So I told my uh, leadership team, for people here, um, failure is not an option. You need to be right first time. And uh, it's got to be a discipline. I hope you study engineering, you will probably agree with me. That's, that's where we want to be. But on this side, I, I don't want them to be right first time. <laughs> they need to try, and failure is absolutely an option. So I hope I answer your question by saying really you need to have different mentality and different structure and that's why I share with you this uh, boat analogy that took my staff to really struggle on that. So hopefully that come out <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Paula and I'm studying a Master of Engineering and Bioengineering. And I had a question because, I mean, Bayer is a global acting company and here we are in the San Francisco Bay Area with a lot of startups where probably um, the people are more like open to the idea of implementing the startup idea in this very old company. But how is it like, for example, with Bayer in, in Europe, are they also trying to implement the startup strategy in their company? Okay, so the question is then how bear us uh, to introduce the whole startup mindset in the company? And I hope I did show you, even though I make that very quick about in that slide of the 150 year old and we have a multiple product. Definitely there's no one company I would say uh, in today's world um, can survive without some innovative ideas. So innovation is a must. Um, so then, in a sense, uh, I cannot say like then because we shake the world in Bayer, Bayer has been thinking about that is very, very important. So I answer your question probably in two different perspectives. The company definitely recognizes it's a very important initiative to allow the startup coming up. And my job and my organization is more about then how we really will be able to make that happen. Because right? then, as I show, there's some strength, uh, different kind of setup. So if I would put the whole container, big ship, all closer to the shore, trying to embrace all those ideas, we got stuck there and going nowhere. Um, so we need to have a different way to introduce that. Really, it's combining the scientific approach as well as the whole system to enable that. Um, we definitely feel like very fortunate to be in the Bay Area, so we are just down by the Bay, hopefully you know, because a lot of people don't. Um, we have a 55 acre land, and you're welcome. I mean, sometime we have the job fair, you can come visit us. And the, we want to leverage this space to uh, invite more novel idea and also uh, a lot of idea and contribution from you. Hi, I'm Kate. I'm a first year bioengineering PhD student. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about your transition from academia to industry, what inspired you to do that, and what were sort of some of the negatives of that transition? Okay, I got that question a lot. Um, <laughs> I, um, it, it was a little bit uh, opportunity driven. Uh, I was not even thinking about to join the biotech um, or industry at all. As I was on my track to in the academic. And it was, uh, I'll probably tell you the story and first then, then answer a little bit about my thinking at that time. Um, I was just uh, being invited to, at the time was BSF and later on become Abbott uh, to give a talk. And at the end of it, they just gave me an offer. And then I say, oh, that's kind of nice. I wasn't thinking about it. And, <laughs> and but they only give me like a f five days because you know how the industry works. So the budget need to close and that was the end of the year before Christmas. So they have to spend it and, but anyway. Um, <laughs> and it wasn't, I share the story about from jumping out of medical school. That was a harder decision, frankly speaking. I mean, no offense to all the faculty at the, t uh, 
it wasn't so hard for me at the time because I think I'm thinking about maybe it's time I can close the loop, coming, getting a little more closer, offering some um, solutions as I was seeking for. And I have to admit, I, I did not really even know how, what they are doing. Um, and, but I take that leap of faith to say, well, let me go in and see how it looks like. So that was how it is. And, but uh, some people may say then a year or two, you may regret, right? And I, I told myself two things. One, I don't want to look back if I made that decision. So in a sense, I don't want to be in the industry, pretend I'm doing academics. So I don't like try to you know, do all the basic research and trying to solve those issues because I think that's really the strength of academic uh, setting should. And I want to see what is exactly a company value. So, um, so then that's company I joined and uh, end up being really the best selling drug now um, in the world, in the whole human history. And at the time I was just so devoted into that. So that's probably the second perspective I would say. I was just very devoted to trying to learn that. And I must also share with you because I don't want to make a story sound so nice. Uh, I have to tell you the whole first year, despite my title of being a faculty, then I feel I'm the most stupid idiot in the <laughs> setting. Seriously, and I, everybody, the research associate, know way more than I do about what they are doing. And it was very painful, but I, I kind of told myself, I make this decision and I got to stick to it. And I try to learn, you know, just go to the bench and ask people the stupid question. I'm so sure they all doubt about my IQ level. And <laughs> then, and then I went through that year, it really uh, was great. I learned so much from people, so I probably, long answer to your question, I think one, um, it was probably opportunity and that's why I couldn't say it was uh, so much about I, I have it all plan now, I go to academic and then I'll go to industry, I did not do that. Um, but I took that opportunity really push myself in the, in the situation. So again, I mean, that fish picture was not random because I think most of the time that's how I feel. Um, more questions? Hi, uh, I'm Chris, a third year Chemi PhD student. I was wondering how often do the startup ideas come from outside startups that you've acquired and how often do they come from internal R&D that buyers doing? And do you, do you know if there's uh, a preference, I guess, to those startups or are you trying to, I guess, emphasize one over the other? The question is about startup ideas, the internal versus external. Bear used to do a lot of internal, kind of with some mixture of external. We are changing the, the, the uh, I guess, strategy now, and we are doing much more external. Um, we still keep the internal to be able to have the innovation going, the, evaluate about what we do best, as I kind of say, uh, academic definitely have much more strengths and small stop can move things very fast. So we think through collaboration um, or maybe even in licensing will be a better opportunity. So then currently, as of today, you asked me this question, then we try to introduce more external. So then I hope you also appreciate with the external startup idea, we need to be even better. Because right? with your own work, you know everything, but then you want to be able to collaborate, keep up the speed, that means you need to be way more equipped and way more knowledgeable than the, uh, doing the innovation all by itself. So I'm not quite sure how other pharmaceutical company does this, but I can speak for, for our biologic side. That's, how, that's our strategy. Uh, hi, I'm Brian. I'm a first year undergraduate bioengineering major. So you said that in high school you prepared to be an engineer. Uh, given the transition from academia to industry, how much of that engineering mindset, the tools that you were equipped with, how much do you use that in your current job and product and loss? That's a good question. I'm glad somebody asked me that. <laughs> so I feel a little bit more related to you guys. Uh, so the question is about how much engineering mindset really helped me. And I must say also maybe one good story to share is when I was uh, uh, interview at a bear maybe. Um, so the R&D had, and he flipped through my resume, right, and said, you are 
medical doctor, I mean, how can you end up being doing the biomanufacturing side? So then we talked through a lot of things. Actually, his comment actually helped me actually realize where I am, because he said, I really think you are back down to the bone, you are an engineer. I didn't even tell him where I went for high school. And then you got all the other knowledge to help you, and you try to apply this engineering mindset to all different disciplines. So I do think I really appreciate that. I'm still very fascinated about the physics and things like that, and I did always get the comments from my staff, particularly from engineering background, say, you are the most engineer boss I ever have. And <laughs> so, because I'm so fascinated by the whole formula and all those <laughs> things, and as I say, on this side of the business, as I say, need to be, failure is not an option, right, for the first time. And I think my staff probably know I'm very, very stringent about that. And, uh, love those design and get things better. Then I don't want to oversimplify about what engineers are about. Um, so I, I guess I can try to fake to be an engineer maybe at some point. Um, that's, uh, <laughs> but I do think that's very, very helpful. So uh, what uh, you are very blessed, uh, blessed in the situation about today is a multidisciplinary area. Um, probably you will be a little bit surprised about why you were saying that is such a distinct background, really back to my days, nobody in medical school even cared about physics. So that's how odd I was. So when I was in medical school, I was the only one get this straight grade about physics and everybody like, who cares about physics? Um, <laughs> and then, and then, so then uh, and I was so enthusiastic about all about it. But you know, I think that helped me uh, for a long term. And that's why, again, I this picture to show you about, you know, maybe a lot of people around you will have different background and you need to find your path to stick to your passion. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Uh, my name is Andoni. I'm a third year PhD student in bioengineering. I'm thinking about the LEAP program. I think you mentioned it as a vehicle to kind of push bear uh, to the forefront of a lot of these emerging technologies like um, gene therapy, DNA editing, et cetera. Uh, what do you look for in the people who are a part of that program, the LEAP program? Um, in order to be able to um, assess which one of those fields will do well or what companies within those fields uh, you should look into more. Yeah, what do those, those people within LEAP look like? Sure. So the question is about our LEAP program. So definitely it is uh, public information. You can definitely, if you Google, you do bear LEAPs, you'll find video. Uh, it has a lot of what exactly we do. The question is about what kind of talent we are looking for. So how we do the uh, LEAPS program is a little bit connected to the earlier question about the startup. So we leave those, we invest towards those company and namely there are two, one focused on gene therapy called Casivia and the other more for cell therapy called Burrot and we leave them alone. So they are not reporting into Bayer or anything and we offer money. <laughs> we do have people sitting on the board but, um, but we don't dictate what they do and they hire their own people, do their own things, and try to explore all this idea. And we do review, make sure things are hitting the Andy, the investigation, um, new drugs application. So other than that, we don't do anything. So then I hope that indirectly answer your question. So basically, it's a startup setting and allow people really throw the idea and try to work there. I work for startup, as, I, as uh, Sujay in her introduction mentioned, actually both for uh, Tenvex and also motivation. And I must say something very, very different from startup, just to share with you the experience. And I, I always say this, wear multiple hats to things. Like then you will feel like uh, you do this, you also do that. You, I mean, every day you may be even in the conversation, in 10 minutes you switch different hat to talk about different things. And that's very different for a large company. And there's a pros and cons, of course. Um, when you wear multiple hats, you may not be deep down enough to understand that particular discipline. However, in big company, definitely there's some advantage you get really get to the, the area you're working on. What we're trying to do is really not so much mix everybody wear multiple hats versus uh, you know, have the one hat to really, st uh, as I kind of share with you, we set up different kind of job in a sense. But back to your question, definitely uh, for the LEAPS program, those company, um, we let them run it, which I can tell you, we want who they know. Actually, we let them, uh, the CEO, and it's probably just less than 20 people company uh, for both of them. Maybe one of them hit already 70, 80. But they're operating really, inviting the 
scientists, engineering, drawing with a lot of novel ideas. We have time for one more, if there is one more. Okay, I think. All right. If not, uh, let's thank uh, Dr. Chow one more time for a very inspirational <laughs> talk. So as a small token of our appreciation, our students would like to give you a gift. It's a Berkeley engineering jacket. Yes, let's take a photo. Keep you warm today. <laughs> We hope that'll keep you warm on the inside and outside. Okay, so uh, just want to thank everybody. Uh, so the uh, Society for Women Engineers again for co-sponsoring uh, co today's event. Hope to see most of you back here on April 16th for the Coup Lecture, and uh, go Bears! Thank you. Thank you again.